Assembly 2023 is what that is called if you are interested in checking that out. Before we get rolling here, I want to share with you a letter that we received this week. This is dated January 22nd, 2023, and it's addressed to Grace Life Bible Church. It says, Hi, Pastor Ross. Greetings and well wishes for 2023 to you and everyone at Grace Life Bible Church from all of us at Grace Bible Church of Minnesota. We are now in our eighth year as a church. We are somewhat amazed by that, especially since we have been without a pastor for several years now. We're still very small and a few people come and go, but we have treasure we but we treasure the fellowship learning and growing together. The ability of strong online teaching is one of the reasons for our longevity and you've been a big part of that. We've recently been enjoying your messages from Colossians. Thank you. And close is a contribution to your ministry. May God continue to bless your labor of love for him. Rosalie Miller from Grace Bible Church of Minnesota. So those of you that are part of that assembly, we certainly appreciate your support of the ministry. Uh, we, we really like and are encouraged by your card and your financial gift to the assembly is very much appreciated as always. And we covered that last Sunday. You know, there's a, there's a live and lively support of the assembly from those who never come uh, because they support us from afar, and we certainly appreciate that. This morning, I want to get back into the book of Galatians, and it's been a few weeks now since we've been in Galatians because we took a break last Sunday to have our congregational meeting, and I'm looking forward to getting back into the text and having a run now of a number of weeks before we are possibly interrupted again by the Easter holiday or something along those lines. I'm not sure what it might be. But we've been going through Galatians chapter 2, and we've been doing so uh, fairly methodically, uh, maybe too slowly for some of you, but I'm trying to go at a pace that captures the sense of what Paul is saying here in this passage. And as we work our way to the end here, he's talking about the issues related to justification, as we saw last Sunday, and he's making some practical points that is very careful, that we need to be very careful to understand exactly what Paul is talking about in these passages. Now, last Sunday we ended, uh, not last Sunday, sorry, last Sunday we were in Galatians two Sundays ago, I talked about the issue of the faith of Christ versus faith in Christ. And we looked at verse 16, look at verse 16 with me. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Um, let's just have a brief word of prayer. Lord, thanks for the day and for this time. We pray as we look now again at your word and specifically from Galatians 2 that we'll have clarity of understanding that the Holy Spirit can be our teacher, that he can illuminate our understanding and help us to grasp uh, what the apostle has to say to us in these verses and how we can uh, really appropriate these things and make them a part of the details of our life. We ask this thing, these things this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Now, you know that as I teach through these things, I try to make sure that we always keep in mind the context of what's being said. The first half of Galatians chapter 2 was a discussion about the Jerusalem council meeting that happened in Acts 15. And Paul, from his point of view, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 1, he starts to uh, talk about that meeting from his viewpoint. After the meeting, if you recall, go back with me to verse... um, Oh, let's see here. Verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave unto me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that, uh, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would, that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. So we've already talked about these things. I just want to remind you of the context now. Verse 11, But when Peter was coming to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles? Why compellest thou, excuse me, the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So we talked about that issue there with Peter, right? How Peter was living one way, and then the guys came from James, and he completely disassembled, 
so much so that Barnabas was carried away with the dissimulation, and Paul withstands Peter to the face, and he says, listen, you can't do this. You can't live in a way that's contrary to what you say you believe. That's verse verse 14. But when I saw they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, so Paul's doing this publicly, withstanding the face and rebuking him. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So Paul rebukes Peter over this issue. We've studied this. Then verse 15, notice, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, and not only, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. So what, I'm, what I want you to see in reading those verses is that the context that Paul is dealing here in is the situation with Peter. He's had to withstand Peter to the face after the Jerusalem council meeting regarding Peter's inconsistent conduct and behavior. And then after he does that, he pivots in verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, and he begins to address Jewish, the Jewish believers, those who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles. And then he says in verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Then he says, even we, that would be those who are Jews by nature in verse 15, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Okay. Now look, watch verse 17, now our first verse for today. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, okay, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? What's the answer? God forbid, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto who? Unto God. So as we think about verse 17, notice what he says. He says, but if while we be justified, if we, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, So stop there. Notice first the contrast. He says, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ. Now, has he just talked about in the previous verse, verse 16, about how they're justified? How are they justified in the previous verse? Read verse 16. Knowing the man is not justified, how? So we talked about how that's a negative statement. It's a statement of how men are not justified. They are not justified, how? They're not justified by the law knowing that a man is not justified by the law, but, contrast, by the faith of who? Of Christ. We talked about that in detail. We are justified by His faithfulness, by the faith of Christ, the faithfulness, the fidelity, the trustworthiness that belongs to Christ, okay? And I have to say, I've thought about that a lot since two weeks ago. I am so glad. There are things going on in my personal life right now that if my justification was tied up in my faithfulness, the quality and the content and the substance of my faith, I would think that I would be in trouble because I know that my faith wanes from time to time. Okay, My faith is not always laser-focused on the Word of God and on the Scriptures, and my mind wanders, and I get thinking about the cares and the things of the world, and my faith wanes from time to time. But my justification is not dependent on the quality and the nature of my faith. It is dependent on the faithfulness of who? Of Christ. The fact that He did everything that was necessary. Notice the verse. knowing that Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So again, that's negative. That's how you're not justified. But by the faith of Jesus Christ. That's His faith. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. See, that's the verb. That's believe there is the verb. That is us believing in Him. We place our faith into His faith. We, yes, we have to believe that we're sinners, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Yes, we have to believe the gospel, right? But the saving power of the gospel is not not a one-sided issue that is only tied to the quality and the nature of my faith and your faith. It is tied up and bound into the one in whom 
we are placing our faith in, which is Jesus Christ. I hope you understand that, right? Verse 16, even we have believed, believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of who? See, we believe in Christ so that we can be justified by whose faith? His faith. It is our faith resting in his faith that justifies us. It is not simply our faith. It is our faith resting in his faith. Now notice again, if you look at that middle phrase of verse 16, I'm going to read it the way the modern versions have that to make a point. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So I read it wrong on purpose. Let me do it again because I'm trying to make... So just think about what it would say. I'm going to read it wrong on purpose. That we might be justified... Sorry, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Do You see, if that's how it reads, it's just a circular argument. Well, why are you saved? Well, I believed in Christ and because I believed in Christ. No, you believed in Christ and put your faith into his faithfulness, into the faith of Jesus Christ. It is not a one-sided issue. It is a two-sided, it's, it's both sides of the coin. He stood in the gap on our behalf suffered and made satisfaction for our sin, was buried and rose again, satisfied the offended justice of God against sin, so that when we put our faith in what he did, God the Father says, that is sufficient for your justification, and it is not reliant on Brian Ross. It is Brian Ross's faith resting in the faith of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith and your faith are worth nothing apart from his faith. Okay? So you got verse 16, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. Here it is. For by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Okay, now notice now verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, so stop and think for a minute, okay? Verse 16 affirmatively states twice that your works don't justify you what justifies you? The faith of Jesus Christ and you believing and trusting and resting in the faith of who? Christ. So verse 16 makes it very clear that your works cannot justify you. It says it twice in the verse. Notice how the verse begins. Knowing the man is not justified by the works of the law. Notice how the verse ends. For by the works of the law there shall no flesh be what? So you got two statements about how you're not justified and sandwiched in between is how you are. All right? Now notice verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ. So if a man wants justification, can he justify himself based on his own works? No. The only place he can get justification from or in is who? Is Christ. So if you want justification in verse 16, in verse 17, you're going to get it from who? So those who are seeking a right standing with God, they're going to get it from who? From Christ. You following the logic here, okay? But if all we seek to be justified by Christ, notice, we ourselves are found what? See, here's the thing. As you approach the righteousness of God and you're seeking justification by faith in Christ, what you realize is that you are in fact a what? sinner, and that you cannot be saved apart from who? From Christ. Are you following me? Okay, look at it again. Verse 17. But while we seek to be justified by Christ, so we're, we're seeking to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found what? So in other words, when we compare our righteousness and our ability to keep the law to do anything, do we fall short of the glory of God? Okay. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Now you see how somebody could gainsay this, right? In fact, hold your hand here. This reminds me a lot. This reminds me a very much of Romans 6. Hold your hand there and go back to Romans 6. Okay? So you're only justified in Galatians by the faith of Christ and your faith resting in his faith, not by the works of the law, and when you seek to be justified by Christ appropriately, you come into, you, you, you run smack dab into the fact and the reality that you're a what? 
that you're a sinner, right? And so Paul says there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? So some skeptic, some gainsayer is going to come around and say, aha, well, what you're saying there is that Christ then is the minister of sin because the only way you can be justified is to realize that you're a sinner and you need him, so therefore Christ is the one responsible for manifesting and ministering what? Sin. Look at Romans chapter 5, end of Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So are, is there all, does God always have more grace than there is sin? Okay? Or can you ever out-sin the grace of God? No. Okay, verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you have just heard Paul say that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, and you can never out the grace of God, then what's the logical next question? Well, should I sin on purpose then to magnify the grace of what? God. Because in my sin, I manifest how much God's grace abounds, so if I just go out and willfully sin, can I... Can I magnify God's grace? Notice Paul anticipates the question here, or better still, the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer what? Therein. So it is not sound, appropriate thinking for a believer who understands the truth of Romans 5 to now think, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and willfully and intentionally sin so I can magnify and make the grace of God abound. That is not appropriate thinking for a believer. Okay? God, verse, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And you realize in Romans 6 that you're dead to sin, but alive unto God through the fact that he's crucified and put to death your old man, right? So is it appropriate behavior and conduct for a believer to go out and sin on purpose so as to make the grace of God abound? The answer is what? No. The similar thinking here, go back to Galatians chapter 2, in what Paul is saying. Look at verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ. So in seeking to be just, if you've understood verse 16, you know beyond doubt that can your work and law keeping save you? No. Okay? But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found what? Sinners. So if you're, if you're wanting to be justified by Christ, you're going to come head first into the reality that he is holy and righteous and just, and you are a what? Sinner. Okay? Is therefore Christ the minister of what? So in other words, is Christ the one who is responsible for the sin so that he can sit there and say, oh, look at me, I justified you? What's the answer to that question? God forbid, absolutely not, may it never be. That's the answer to that question, okay? So you need to note the contrast there, okay? Now, again, I've, everything I've said now, I haven't used any notes to say it, so let me just say a few things. So what's the first thing you must admit then if you want to be justified by Christ? The first thing that you have to admit is that you're a sinner and that your works are worth nothing when it comes to your eternal salvation. That's the whole point of verse 16, right? So, because, because you have to come to this realization and admit you're a sinner to be justified, does that mean then that Christ is the originator of your sin? The answer to that is what? God forbid, absolutely not, may it never be, no way, no shape, no form, never. You following that? So, notice again though the use of the word we in verse 17. Remember that Paul's including himself here with Israel in the statement. Look at verse 15. We, for, uh, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. And twice in verse 16 he says we. And even, uh, uh, let's see here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we, so that's those who are Jews by nature, have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Verse 17, 
but, for, but, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin. The other very profound thing that you can't miss there is, is Paul saying to Jews, those who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, that if they want justification before God, they have to come to God exactly the way the Gentiles are. Yep. Because is there any favored standing for Israel any longer today in the dispensation of grace? So there's a lot going on in these verses, and it's easy to miss it if you just read through them fast. So verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I once, the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? Now notice the pronoun there is I. So now is Paul talking about his own behavior and his own conduct. And he's saying this in a context where he has just withstood Peter to what? To the face. And why did he withstand Peter to the face? Because Peter's conduct was out of line with the truth. And by Peter erring in his conduct, had he caused other people to be carried away with his dissimulation, so does Paul in verse 14, withstand him to the face. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now we have verse, so then you have verse 15, 16, and 17 sandwiched in between there, and then you have verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed... I make myself a what? So think about it with me, if you would, please. What Peter had done in withdrawing his fellowship from the Gentiles was an effect, in practical, of practical effect, to rebuild the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile that Paul had been seeking to tear down through his what? Through his preaching. Because through Peter's conduct there, do you have a division now becoming between the Jewish believers and the Gentile members of the body of Christ? And Paul rebukes him for it. Then he comes down a few verses later, verse 18, he says, For if I build again the things which I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> We know in verse 11, 12, and 13, verse 11 and 12, Paul lays out the characteristic distinction of time past. How time past, in time past, God dealt with the world on the basis of a distinction between Israel, the circumcision, and the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. In time past, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who the Gentiles were in time past. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye, are, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now look at verse 14, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. See, what was Peter doing when he disassembled and Barnabas was carried away with his dissimulation so much so that he was creating a rift now in the body of Christ? What he was doing was he was functionally re-erecting the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. So go back to Galatians chapter 2. Look at verse... 18 again, for if I build again the things which I once destroyed, I make myself a what? A transgressor. So we know from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, we know that through the message and the preaching of Paul, Christ had already broke down the middle wall partition. And Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 2 verse um, 18, he's saying that if he goes back to building a wall of law keeping and differences between Jews and Gentiles, he himself is transgressing his own teaching. I make 
myself a what? A transgressor. For if, no, so, so it's him. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, has he, been, has he been endeavoring in his ministry to pull down the middle wall partition in the understanding of Jew and Gentile? And what Peter had done in the context is he had gone back through his conduct and he, he, had he functionally sort of rebuilt it. Okay? For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, remember Paul's, hold your hand there, go back to chapter 1 of Galatians. Remember his strong warning to anyone preaching another gospel. Go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ <clears throat> unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man. And that would include who? That would include Paul. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than uh, unto you than ye have received, let him be what? So if Paul changes his mind, what is he saying there in chapter 1? He's saying, if I change my mind and I come back to you and I preach something different than what I would preach the first time or when I was there in the past, I have made myself what? A curse. That's what he's saying. So that take that idea now, go back to chapter 2, look at verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? A transgressor. So if Paul were building or seeking to re-erect a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles, okay, he would be functionally rebuilding back up the middle wall partition, Okay, and he would have condemned himself by words out of his own what? Mouth. So when he says in verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? He makes, so does Paul, can Paul function in a way that he would make himself a transgressor out of things, contradicting things that he himself has already taught? Now, notice verse 19. Now, how, let me ask you this question. How would he rebuild the middle wall? How would he, how would he build again the things which he destroyed? The way he would do it is by putting people under what? The law. Go back to verse 12, same chapter. For before that certain came from James, talking about Peter, he did eat with the Gentiles. And when they, and when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews disassembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. See, the guys come from James, and they come from James as zealous of the law, and Peter is intimidated by them, and so does he revert back to the old way, to the old system, his own, you know, his old way of doing things, and does he remove himself from the Gentiles? And if there's anybody that should have known better, it was who? It was Peter. Had he seen in Acts 10 the vision of the sheet, and was he sent by God to Cornelius? But now, because of what's going on and the reinsertion of the law, he has now reverted back to the law, and in reverting back to the law, he separated himself from the Gentiles, functionally re-erecting the middle wall of partition, and Paul rebukes him for it. And he says again in verse 13, And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly, now don't miss the next phrase, according to the truth of the gospel. What was Paul's gospel? That a man is justified not by the works of the law, but by the faith of who? Jesus Christ, right? And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? What was he doing? He was not 
He was not functioning, not operating in light of the truth of Paul's gospel, and by doing so was he creating confusion and functionally re-erecting that middle wall partition between Jew and Gentile. With that in mind, Paul says everything in verse 15, 16, and 17, and into verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? See, what, what, when he withstood him to the face, what was he doing? So work with me on a little thought experiment, okay? What if Paul knew that Peter was doing this, and he was just like, ah, it's all good, Pete. You're under grace, do what you want. What would, it, what would have been the ramifications of that? The ramifications of that is Paul would have practically been allowing for the middle wall partition to be what? Re-erected in their case, in, in the, between the midst of Jew and Gentiles here in, in these assemblies. And he says in verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Why did he go, why did he go to Jerusalem council in the first place? He went to the Jerusalem council in the first place. Go back to chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel that I preach among who? The Gentiles. And when Peter is carried away, he says that he walked not uprightly according to the truth of what? The gospel causing the Jews to disassemble likewise from the Gentiles. And then he says in verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a what? See, is Paul bound? This is one of the most amazing things to me. is how inconsistent people are in their thinking. Okay? People are very inconsistent in their thinking. What do I mean? They will subscribe to A, B, and C. Okay? And they'll be sound on A, B, and C. But then when it comes to D, F, G, and H, etc., they're like believing things that are completely contrary to what they say about A, B, and C. That's kind of a, maybe a dumb example, but you get what I'm saying. That's not Paul. Paul's saying, I have to be, I have to not only be logically consistent on what I'm teaching, but I have to follow that through with how I live. Because if I, through my living, re erect what I seek to destroy, I make myself a what? A transgressor. Now, verse 19. <clears throat> verse 19. Again, notice the pronoun, for I, through the law. So in case you missed what he's talking about in the previous verse, what's he still talking about? The law. So how would he build again the things which he destroyed? The way he would do that is to live a life in relationship to what? The law. He says in verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law. That I might live unto who? Unto God. So this is an interesting verse, okay? Verse, verse 19 is an interesting verse, and so here's how I want to sort of go after this, okay? You'll notice that it's like one sentence. Look at it. For I through the law, for, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Very short, one sentence, but extremely profound. All right? So I think the best way to attack this or unpack this, the idea of this verse is by sort of looking at some relevant passages first and then coming back and looking at this verse again. Okay? So let's look at a few points. Some of these will be a little bit of review from where we were last time, but come with me back to Romans chapter 3. So we're looking at what does he mean, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Well, is a believer today dead to the law? What's the answer? The answer is yes. If you're a believer today, if you've trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith into the faith of Christ, has the law fulfilled its purpose for you? Romans chapter 3, verse 19. 
Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are what? Under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified because, in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of what? See, the best the law can do is tell you you're guilty. The best the law can do is tell you that you're a sinner, that you're guilty, and that you fall short. Now, is there anything wrong with the law? Is God's law somehow unholy or unjust or unrighteous? No. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with who? The problem is with us. Okay? So the law, all the law can do is manifest sin. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 6. Paul says, from which some having sword have turned aside unto vain jangling. So he's talking about sound doctrine. Look at the end of verse 3. Uh, that thou mightest charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Verse 6, from which some having sword have turned aside unto vain jangling. So they've swerved and turned aside unto false teaching. That which is not sound doctrine. That which is another doctrine, so to speak. Well, what are they doing? Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now look, folks, you've got to understand. You know, I, you read a verse like that and people get mad at the guy who reads it. If you're going to get mad about that verse, get mad at the guy who wrote it. The guy who wrote it said that people who are desiring to teach the law today don't know what they're doing. They've swerved aside, and they've entered into vain jangling. They've entered into empty, worthless talking that is of no profit. Okay? Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. For, but we know that the law is good. So is there anything inherently wrong with the law? No. But we know that the law is good, notice the next word, if a man use it, how? Lawfully. So that tells me right there, is there a lawful and unlawful use of the law? Is there an appropriate and an inappropriate use of the law? Well, what is it? Verse 9, knowing this. So now he's going to tell you what it is. That the law is not made for who? For a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for manstealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to what? So who's the law for? The just, righteous, justified saint? Or for the ungodly and sinners and for profane, i.e. the unsaved? So what is the lawful use of the law? The lawful use of the law is to manifest and declare to a lost man that he is short of the glory of God. You with that? So if you're saved, if you're justified, if you're declared, if you've been given the very righteousness of God imputed to your account through justification, through faith in the, your faith resting in the faith of Christ, then does the law have any power, any force, anything over you anymore? No, because you are in the one, you have been placed into the one that satisfied the righteous requirements of that law. You're in Christ. And because you're in Christ, you have the righteousness of God imputed to you because when Christ died there on the cross, did he take the, did he take the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, Colossians chapter 2, and did he take it out of the way, nailing it where? To his cross. So if you are saved, the law has no function for you. If you are still lost, if you are not in Christ, if you have not replaced your faith into the faith of Christ, and you're not justified, are you still under the condemnation that the law puts you under and says that you're guilty before God? I do not know where this idea came from that everyone was automatically forgiven of all their sin at the cross. Did Jesus Christ pay for all sin at the cross? Yes. But you are not forgiven until you are in Him. Okay? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So before you were quickened by Christ, where, what was your condition? You were dead in what? Sin. Where in a time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So why are they not that anymore? The reason they're not that anymore is because they're in who? Because they're in Christ. So the natural man is officially declared dead in trespasses and sins. All the natural man knows how to do is sin. Okay? He can try and turn from his sin all he wants to, but he cannot turn from what he's dead in. See, if you're dead in sin and I tell you, turn from your sin, are you still in your sin? What you need is a redeemer who paid the price to redeem you out of your what? And that's exactly what Christ did for you. One of the titles that Paul gives him is he says that he's redeemed us. Go to Romans 7. Now this is all going somewhere, I promise. You just have to wait. It's still good stuff as we get there. Romans 7. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? What's the answer? God forbid. No, the law is not sin. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So how do you know what it means to lust or to lie or to cheat or to steal? You know what those things are because did God state what they are in the law? Okay? Verse, uh, end of verse 7. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now watch. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was what? Dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the law came, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I what? See, the law, all the law can do is kill the believer. Can't take away your salvation, but can it come into your life and put you under its condemnation and practically, functionally kill you and to get you to live after its dictates and not after what? Grace. We already talked about go to Colossians chapter 2 go to Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 Colossians chapter 2, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? See, the believer's soul and spirit have been cut loose from his flesh so that he can be joined unto who? Unto Christ. Okay? I'm almost there. Go back to, go back to Romans 6. Go back to Romans 6. We'll look at verse 1 again. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That's not spiritual baptism there. That's identification, spiritual identification. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death that like us Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of what? In life. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve what? See, now that you're a believer anymore, do you have to serve sin? You're not the slave of sin. You're not the servant of sin any longer. You've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Your soul and spirit have been cut away from that body of flesh, that body of sin, that body of death, and he crucified your old man. It's dead. It's gone. It's taken out of the way. For he that is dead, he that is, dead is freed from sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin how many times? Once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, here's the point, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come back with me to Mark, Mark Romans 6. Come back with me to Galatians 2. Come back to Galatians 2. Look at verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to what? How is he dead to the law? What, what, what function did the law serve? The function of the law served was to manifest his what? His sin. When the Lord Jesus Christ found Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, was he a Pharisee of the Pharisee? Was he a Hebrew of Hebrews? As touching the righteousness that was in the law, was, was Paul by his own testimony blameless? But in the presence of Jesus Christ himself, did he realize real quick that his best efforts in law keeping left him short of the glory of God? So, if I build, a, uh, verse 19, for I through the law, did the law manifest to Saul of Tarsus that he was a sinner and he could not save himself? For I through the law am dead to what? To the law. <clears throat> that I might live unto who? So what's Paul's argument here? Here's his argument. Through the law, he was led to recognize that he was no longer under the law. The righteousness that is of the law depended upon a perfect keeping of the law. Since no one is able to perfectly keep the law, it became a revealer of sin rather than a giver of what? Life. Okay? He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 10, that the commandment that was supposed to bring about life actually brought about what? Death. So in other words, Romans 3.20, in other words, through the law, Paul was faced with the fact that he was a sinner, which ultimately made him see his need for who? Now, you know, you think about what happened to him. His experience was unique. I mean, imagine he's walking around. He, he's, he's walking around thinking he's doing the right thing. And Jesus Christ from heaven's glory in his glorified form appears to him as a, as a light, greater, brighter than the noonday sun. And this is the Ross version. says to him, what do you think you're doing here, buddy? He's face down in the Arabian sand. Is he the chief of sinners? If anybody ever deserved the wrath of God for sin, it was him. But instead of dealing with him in his wrath, what does the mercy and grace of God do? It allows him to get up. And not only to get up, not only to save him, but then he takes that guy who was leading the rebellion against the, the believing church in Israel, he takes that guy that was leading the rebellion and does it make him the apostle of the Gentiles. We sing that song, Oh What Love. I mean, you talk, about, you, you talk about things that are not easy to comprehend. How God is able to do this with the guy who's his arch enemy number one. So Pastor Stam has a little illustration of this in his commentary on Galatians. I want to read it to you. 
It's from page 134 to 135. So, so think about this illustration. I think it's a good one. He says, there was a man who, was robbed, who has robbed and killed another man. So has he broken the law? And the police are looking for him. While they are cruising about, stopping at homes to ask questions, a call comes through to them about a serious accident elsewhere. There was a crash uh, there at the crash scene. They find their criminal. He is dead, killed in the crash. So the guy they were looking for has been in this car accident, and now he's what? Now he's dead. He is dead, killed in the crash. What can the law do? Arrest him? He's dead. Take him away to jail? He's dead. Take him to court? No, it's over. The guy's what? Dead. The whole thing has been taken out of their hands. Whatever the law would have intended to do with this guy based upon his first breakage of the law is now a moot point because he's dead and the law now has no more dominion over him because he's dead. It was taken out of their hands. Paul gives us the concept as Paul gives us the concept as just one of the reasons we are under grace and not under the law of Moses. Through grace, they should do better than if they were under the law. But they are not under the law. The law has more juris, has no more jurisdiction over them because they are dead to the law because of who? Christ. You see that illustration? You know, you commit a crime in Michigan and you flee to the border for Canada. You cross, successfully cross the border into Canada and you can stand back and say, nah, because they don't have any what? Jurisdiction. The law does not have any jurisdiction over a believer anymore because Christ paid off the law, he satisfied the law, and the believer is in Christ. So when we go back and put ourselves under the law, are we, are we functionally erecting the thing that was sought to be destroyed on our behalf? Look at, go back to Galatians chapter 2. He says it right there in verse 19, For I, through the law, am dead to what? The law. Because he's in Christ. That, purpose and the intent, that I might live unto who? See, here's the deal, guys. We have the choice between two operating systems in our life. Okay? Operating system number one is the law. What does the law do? It condemns. It declares you guilty. It says failure, 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 failure. And it puts you in a system of non-victory, Compared to grace, the second operating system, where you've been saved by grace, you have a standing in grace, and you have the ability now, out of that grace, to live unto who? Unto God. And Paul's whole point in this section, look at verse 17. For if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found, are, are found sinners. Is therefore Christ a minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to what? The only way that's possible is if he has placed his faith into the faith of Christ three verses earlier. Because was the faith of what Christ did on the cross, did he satisfy what that law required? And in satisfying what that law required, he paid it off. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto who? You know, sometimes I think we hear messages like this, 
and we read stuff like that. And I, I, I do. I think sometimes we think, oh, that, that can't be me. That verse can't be about me because I know, you know, what I've done and I know what happened last night or on the car to church this morning and, you know, I know what's going on with my family or my kids or my job or my finances or, you know, whatever it is. And the reality of the situation is, is that God has given us a life of victory through His Son to live unto Him. Not condemnation, not law-keeping, not all of that stuff, but a life of grace and a life that we can live unto the Father because of the work of the Son on our behalf. So, what we see going on here in the book of Galatians from a big, big picture, if we kind of zoom out and just look at this from a big picture we really do see Paul correcting the doctrinal errors that the Galatians had entered into because they were not holding the line in terms of who and what they were on the basis of the truth of the gospel that they believed. And how do I know this is about life? Okay, You're in verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now watch verse 20. I am crucified with who? Are you dead with Christ? Okay? Nevertheless, I what? Hello. Do you understand that you're like living? You're, you are, we are, we are the living dead. That's what we are. We're the living dead. You know that movie, The Night of the Living Dead? It was a sound doctrinal movie. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. See, you're alive, but it's not you. It's weird, right? But it's true. You try to tell me and understand. You try to come and tell me what all this is going on in this verse. There's something here. There's, this is plunging the depths of your identity with Christ in this verse. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. So you're alive, but it's not you. But Christ that liveth where? In me. So you're alive. You're dead, but you're alive, and as you're dead but alive, it's not really you that's alive, it's Christ living in you, is what he's saying. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh. See, until the day of redemption, are you living the life of Christ in this mortal flesh? Okay? And the life which I now live in the flesh, now watch, I live by the faith, not in the Son of God, but the faith of who? The Son of God. It is not your life, it's His life. And it's the life that He gave you because of the faithfulness and the fidelity and the trustworthiness of His Son. How do I know? Read the rest of the verse. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself what? See, so do we have the ability to live unto God? We have the ability in verse 19 to live unto God because the life that we've been given is not based upon us, our faithfulness, our fidelity, our trustworthiness. It's based upon the faith of Jesus Christ. And so we have the ability now to literally be the night of the living dead. And by the way, it's nighttime, isn't it? <laughs> That, 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 I told you that movie was more doctrinal than you realize, okay? All right. Now, we, we're, I got to stop because of the time, but I have a lot more to say about verse 20 to next week, okay? But you got to understand that it is, you cannot just jump in here and sort of read quick through and not grasp everything Paul's saying. Because he's making one of the most powerful arguments that he makes in all of his epistles for why our life matters, for why our life means something, okay? And it's not going to be fulfilled based upon law-keeping and moralizing and all of that that religion wants to do. It's going to be living out, of the, living out of the robust grace that God has given us in his Son and the life that we live, we live because of his, him in us. And he put himself in us because we put our faith in the Son, our faith, into the faith of his Son. Do you think God is happy with his Son? And do you understand that whatever God's happiness meter is with his Son, 
is the same meter that he has for you. That's crazy, but it's true. It's crazy true. Because I look at myself a lot and I say, wow, you know, we sing that song, you know, about the make this wretch, uh, how's that line go? Um, to make this wretch, you guys that are in the music, somebody help me out here. I can't remember how it goes. You know what I'm talking about. But it's the grace of God, folks. Next Sunday, we'll pick this up with verse 20. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. Lord, I pray that we will understand the depths of this issue. I pray that the young people will understand this. I pray that the old people will understand this. I pray that all the in-betweeners will understand this. I pray that the body of Christ will, will grasp it and that we can keep it on the tip of our mind. Not in the back. Not collecting cobwebs and dust and a great thing we talk about every 10 years when we study Galatians. But a, a realize that as sure as we are alive in a body of flesh on this planet until the day of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ is taking us as a believer and wanting to live His life in us. And it's not based on us and our faithfulness, and our ability, and our trustworthiness, it's based upon the faith of Jesus Christ. I pray that we will understand these issues, that we'll cherish these issues,